Let me bid you welcome. You're watching One Take Shakespeare. I'm your host, Penny, and I'm going to break it down for you in one continuous take. Well, last week we covered a tragedy with a surprising amount of comedy in it. So this week, let's cover a comedy with a surprising amount of tragedy in it. This is Much Ado About Nothing. Now, for once we get a play with a relatively uncomplicated history. Much Ado was written most likely in 1598-99 and published once in quarto in 1600 before the first folio in 1623. The first recorded performance was at court in the winter of 1612-1613, but we know it was performed publicly before the 1600 publication because it says so on the title page. Now, the main plot of Much Ado About Nothing between Hero and Claudio, which I'll get into in a minute, is another idea that was not new, especially in the Renaissance. However, the most likely source was probably one of the novelle, or tales, by Matteo Bandello, possibly by way of a French translation. Shakespeare also may have taken some plot ele elements and characters from Orlando Furioso by our old friend Ludovico Ariosto. The subplot, on the other hand, between Beatrice and Benedict is pretty much all Shakespeare. Well, oh, that was easy. Now we get into the plot, which is slightly less so. Okay, we open in Messina, where we meet the governor, Leonardo, his daughter, Hero, and his niece, Beatrice. They've come out to meet the prince, Don Pedro, who is returning victorious from a war and is apparently going to stay and party in Messina for a bit. Now, in Don Pedro's company, we have BFFs Claudio and Benedict, our two for want of a better word, romantic male leads. Now, Beatrice and Benedict have this this snark war going on from way back in the backstory, and as soon as they see each other, they pick up right where they left off. Meanwhile, Claudio sees Hero, and even though they don't say two words to each other, they fall in love. As you do. Claudio gets Don Pedro to ask Leonardo for Hero's hand, and the wedding is on. Unfortunately, Don Pedro's party also contains his brother, Don John. This guy is a bastard. Literally, he's an illegitimate child. He is also a grade-A unfiltered jerk, though, and he decides he's going to try to mess up this wedding. Just, you know, for kicks. Nice guy, Don John. Now, in the intervening couple days before the wedding, our heroes have to kill time somehow. The winning plan? Set up Beatrice and Benedict. Because, you know, in Shakespeare, snark means love. Claudio and Don Pedro and Leonardo stage a thing where Benedict will overhear them talking about how much Beatrice is secretly in love with him. Then, Hero and one of her maids pull the same trick on Beatrice. This works, surprisingly, and they start to fall for each other. All is not well, though, because Don John and his two buddies, Conrad and Baraccio, have a scene of their own to stage. This one makes Claudio think that Hero is cheating on him, but instead of talking to her about it like a sensible person, he waits until the wedding, denounces her in public, and storms out, vowing never to love again. Now, obviously, Hero is innocent, but there is no talking to Claudio, so the priest who was supposed to be performing the wedding devises this plan. Hero will hide, and they will all say that she's dead, that she died of shame at this false accusation, and this will make Claudio regret leaving her at the altar. It's a comedy. It doesn't have to be logical. Meanwhile, Beatrice and Benedict confess their feelings for each other, and she convinces him to go challenge Claudio to a duel, which never actually happens. Okay, so during all this, the Watch, who are really pretty incompetent, have somehow managed to catch Don John's two henchmen, mostly by accident. They actually try to tell Leonardo about this before the wedding, but between their incompetence and his busy ness, nothing comes of it until later. When they finally manage to get the case heard, it turns out that Don John has skipped town. Oops. So, when Leonardo decides that Claudio has shown the proper amount of contrition, he proposes that Claudio marry this niece of his. Not, not Beatrice, some other niece that we're just now hearing about. Claudio agrees to this, and surprise, the niece turns out to actually be Hero, and everything is explained. So they're reunited, Beatrice and Benedict get together, like, officially, and a messenger comes in to say that they caught Don John. They all kind of go, meh, we'll deal with him tomorrow. But that's the play. So, uh, I'm not gonna lie, 
here, when you try to explain this play, it sounds a little strange and confusing, but the dichotomies and deceptions and like 180 degree turnabouts that make this play really weird to read and analyze are what makes it awesome to watch. So let's look at a couple of them. Now the first thing I have to mention here is that is that the title. Much Ado About Nothing. Now in Elizabethan English, the word nothing would have been pronounced the same as the word noting, which meant, you know, seeing or hearing or observing. And this play is all about seeing and hearing and observing. It's Much Ado About Noting. Now, a lot of what the characters note in this play is deliberately false and deceptive, which can actually lead to good things like Beatrice and Benedict, but can also lead to wedding drama freakout. Now, okay, now speaking of Beatrice and Benedict, let's talk about them for a second. Shakespeare loves subplots, and Much Ado is one of the many plays in which a subplot kind of takes over the play. Technically, the main plot of Much Ado is Claudio and Hero and the deception and the drama, but what most people remember about this play is Beatrice and Benedict. They are, they are parallel, though. We should call them, like, parallel plots, because Shakespeare plays them off against each other all through the play. On one hand, we have the courtly, romantic, straight-from-the-Italian-Renaissance couple, and then on the other side, parallel to them, we have the... English theater snarky battle of the sexes couple, and it's really interesting to watch which of them seems to work better. Hint, it's not Hero and Claudio. Now, I'm not saying Shakespeare was like making any kind of relationship judgment here, I'm just saying I know which relationship I'd want to be in. Now, it doesn't, it doesn't help that Hero and Claudio actually have someone working actively against them, which is another problem right there, the Don John problem. Why is he Pardon the pun, such a bastard. Well, it is true that illegitimate children, especially of nobles, had a really marginalized place in Elizabethan society. They couldn't inherit lands or titles and were generally always subordinate to their legitimate siblings. Which doesn't really excuse Don John, because unlike, for example, Edmund in King Lear, he never really mentions any of this. So he is basically just another character who's bad because he's bad. Granted, a vice character in a comedy is a little strange, but okay. Really, a lot of things in this play are strange. The whole play is strange. Now, it's not as overtly weird as some of the comedies, like Measure for Measure, or All's Well That Ends Well, or The Two Gentlemen of Verona, or, well, okay, basically like half of them. But it takes a pretty dramatic shift in tone there at the wedding, and for a couple scenes it looks like the whole play is gonna like veer off into Othello territory and get really tragic. But, and I know I say this like every episode, but, for all the weirdness, this play is really awesome. Now, you know, what can I say? If Shakespeare plays weren't weird, they wouldn't be so interesting. And Much Ado About Nothing is interesting. It's, it's basically got it all. Snark, wordplay, villainy, music, romance, and just enough tragedy to make it a really compelling comedy. You've been watching One Take Shakespeare. See you next time.